institution from early America that was probably the most central institution for accessing community in British North America, and that was the Augustan Club. And I want to argue that what made it so successful, and what I think makes it a model for, for future forms of association and access, is the combination it made of the principle of liberty and equality, Republican principles, with the principle of pleasure and fun. Now, most of us, when we think of these clubs in the, uh, from the 18th century, think about them as what they're probably most celebrated for, spreading the ideals of enlightenment and enlightened knowledge. These were the clubs that sponsored most of the scientific demonstrations, experiments, and lectures that cooperated in things like the observation of the transit of Venus in the 1760s. They were also associated with the uh, public display of theatrical and musical performances, which were generally also club events. But even publications and print materia were very often the result of club activity. To just give one example, here in New York City, the independent reflector and watchtower, which are celebrated among historians as probably the most strident defenses of religious freedom and modern Republican liberty in British North America, were both hatched within a club and drafted within a club. Clubs did more than this. They also created valuable public institutions. Again, I want to focus on New York City. New York City's first subscription library and that institution of higher learning that is today Columbia University were both hatched and planned within clubs. In Pennsylvania, probably the most valuable in, uh, club for creating institutions was Benjamin Franklin's Junto Club. It created not only Philadelphia's fire company and fire insurance company, its street cleaning and street lighting initiatives, its first circulating library, but for the colony as a whole, it also sponsored and created the first volunteer militia, the paper currency, and even the University of Pennsylvania, all from one club. So clubs were not only useful, they were also very popular, increasingly popular as the century went along, especially in seaports, where population was small and alternative entertainments few. Tiny Annapolis, in the early 1750s, Tiny Annapolis claimed some 17 clubs in its immediate environs. By the early 1760s, every single seaport in British North America had at least one Masonic Lodge, some as many as four, and almost every single college had its clubs, usually devoted to oratory or uh, the performance of bell letters. Now, the reason clubs were so popular, the reason they were so successful, was they, because they combined two distinct principles. One, the principles of Republican liberty and self-government, but also the principle of shared interest and refined pleasure. And it was the combination of these features that constituted the principal appeal of club life, offering liberty and happiness, edification and entertainment in equal doses. So I'd like to begin with the Republican character of the club and specifically look at some of the Republican ideals that clubs embraced. Obviously, fraternal organizations embrace the ideal of fraternity, and we don't need to say much about that. But it's striking how important equality was to club life. And that's because all clubs were governed by the rule of what was known at the time as complacence. And that is that once one entered a club, all distinctions of birth, of class, of wealth, of religious affiliation, even of occupational status, had to be put aside. Writing on behalf of the Proteus Echo Club of Boston in the 1720s, Mather Biles insisted, all conversation is built upon equality. Title and distinction must be laid aside in order to talk and act sociably, and the ungrateful names of superior and inferior must lose themselves in that more acceptable and familiar one the companion. Another example, at Yale, when the Lenonian Society, a student club, broached the, breached the rule of equality by excluding freshmen, their fellow students organized in an alternative club known as the, quote, Brothers in Unity to attack them for their aristocratic posture. Well, in short order, the Lenonians not only dropped their restrictions, but then turned and joined the Brothers in Unity 
to lobby the college in 1767 to drop its class ranking. College class rankings were done based on social status rather than academic achievement. So equality was also, as well as fraternity, central to the club, but so too was liberty. As the head of Annapolis's Masonic Lodge proclaimed in a written oration, the very essence of Masonry was a plan or scheme originally intended to promote and establish liberty in the largest and most extensive sense of the word. And in fact, within the club, within its closed ranks, one would have found the greatest liberty to speak on any range of normally prescribed topics in 18th century society. But it wasn't merely the ideals of republicanism that were championed by the club. The club itself was organized as a republic. Clubs met at fixed times. They were governed by popularly elected officers whose titles and terms were demarcated in written constitutions and bylaws. The officers of the Colony and Skull Cold, which was an exclusive Pennsylvania fishing club, included a governor, a secretary, a sheriff, a five-member assembly, and a coroner. He inspected the catch. The Ubiquarians of Charleston modeled their government on that of the Roman constitution in its most perfect phase. So they were ruled by a praetor who presided over censors, senators, and edels. The Tuesday Club of Annapolis, with which we'll turn towards the end of our talk, had a president, secretary, club champion, sergeant at arms, attorney general, speaker, master of ceremonies, two agents, one for London and one for the other colonies, and a poet laureate and poet taster. Clubs also imposed civic obligations. Members were required to attend all meetings and regularly pay their dues, though the dues were called taxes. They were obliged to maintain the secrecy of club proceedings and membership. Often, club members were assigned to prepare topics for discussions of a future meeting, or summarize assigned readings, or prepare a declamation. But perhaps most importantly, clubs demanded of all members that they adopt rules of polite discourse, rules that exemplified the ideals of a thoroughly modern order of Republican association. In particular, dogmatism and temper were proscribed. And for good reason, any club was likely to include members of opposing political factions, of different religions, uh, of opposing worldviews, as well as different occupational communities or ethnicities. So clubs responded to these, this potential source of friction, of anger and dogmatism, by imposing conventions of conversational etiquette. Now, in some cases, here in New York, the Ubiquarians, for example, um, they were able to do this simply by consensus. But in most cases, they actually formulated explicit rules. So I mentioned Franklin Swinto Club. It passed an ordinance that, quote, all expressions of positiveness in opinion or of direct contradiction are explicitly forbade. Newport's Jewish Gentlemen's Club penalized convertive combative comments on the affairs of the synagogue with a, quote, fine of four bottles of good wine. Uh, to the Tuesday Club of Annapolis would, uh, when tempers rose, uh, respond by a signal from their president to break out into um, wild laughter. This was called the Gelastic Law, to sort of break up the mood and change the topic. Now, these rules taught members two critical virtues, virtues that were essential to the Anglophone Enlightenment. One. Tolerance and forbearance of different points of view, especially in matters of politics and religion. Learning to disagree without being disagreeable. Secondly, moderation in discourse and opinion. Moderation and toleration not only made conversation possible, they made it pleasurable. As Matthew Adams said, society is to unloose and unbend the mind and not to have something of gaiety and sprightliness in it. If it should be serious, it ought to be cheerful. It should never be affected. So the club was then not only a Republican institution, it was also an association of pleasure and interest. Indeed, much of the attraction of club life in early America wasn't simply that it was edifying, but it was downright fun. As one champion of colonial club life insisted, 
the very, quote, quintessence, marrow, and main fulcrum of clubs consists in gaiety, jollity, pleasantry, and jocosity. So what would gather clubs together? What kind of shared interests? Well, one might, might be something as simple as a shared profession. Indeed, the first polite clubs in British North America were made up of merchants who would gather once a week at a tavern for an elegant meal and adult beverages and uh, discuss religion, uh, politics, trade, and uh, literature. Um, the early medical community of Boston met at the Sun Tavern and convened as the physical club. In Philadelphia, they met as the medical society. The leading lawyers of New York met at, here at the Moot Club, as did Boston's attorneys at the Sodalitas. Even artisans would meet in clubs, the most famous being the Leather Apron Club, later known as the Junto, uh, but it was only the most famous of a variety of assemblages of self-taught skilled tradesmen. Clubs might also organize on a shared ethnic background. Uh, Charleston was riddled with ethnic clubs. The French met at the Huguenot Two-Bit Club. Hibernians at either the Irish Society or Saint Pat the Sons of St. Patrick. West countrymen convened at the Welsh Club, Germans at the German Friendly Society, and the Scots and English gathered under the banners of St. Andrew and St. George. Now, these clubs not only planned ethnic uh, relief for the disadvantaged members of their community, they also organized ornate dinners and um, parades, all sorts of things to enrich the civic life of their communities. Clubs might be organized around a shared pastime. The Music Club of Philadelphia gathered to perform some of the first concertos in that city. Throughout the colonies, literary clubs assembled for readings of poetry, essays, and other belletristic effusions. And the aspiring orators, or Demosthenes of Maryland, met in the Forensic Club. Even more earthly pleasures uh, witnessed the various hunting societies of the Chesapeake, or the more than four fishing clubs in the Delaware. Indeed, a shared taste in a particular dish could be the basis of forming a club. The Hominy Club, the Smoking Club, or, or one that we just proscribed a few minutes ago, the Beefsteak Club. <laughs> in fact, shared, uh, the shared pleasures of the table was one of the features that defined the culture of Augustan clubs, that added pleasure to conversation as that consummate clubman and the first modern journalist, Joseph Addison, uh, wrote, our modern celebrated clubs are founded upon eating and drinking, which are points wherein most men agree. So it was this combination then of pleasure and Republican equality that created the popularity of the club and created the context for the central activity of the club, which was the experience of enlightened conversation. Now, most such conversation was organized around a pre-approved topic, topics that could range over any number of potential fields. So here in New York, the Unarians mostly focused on politics and related fields, but they also debated the virtues of Epicureanism and questioned the doctrines of eternal damnation. The young junto of Philadelphia were more focused on scientific and philosophical topics, such as the nature of truth, they asked, is light or light and heat different manifestations of the same phenomena? But they also debated the Rousseauian question about the advantages of civilized life over the state of nature, as well as, quote, the common causes that occasion the downfall of an empire. But regardless of the topic, all discourse was governed by those rules of conversational etiquette. Etiquette and good nature, which were governed by the discursive imperatives of politeness, Brevity and clarity. When you added wit to that combination, then club conversation could take on a distinctly performative character. And nowhere was this performative character more evident than in club political play. For clubs were not merely organized in strictly rep Republican forms that used those forms to engage in critical reflections on political issues and controversies through what one scholar is called a parodic prism. Now, the most common form of such play was bombast and hyperbole. For example, the Hominy Club would critique the growing litigiousness and political fractiousness of pre-revolutionary America 
by enacting frivolous mock trials and prosecutions of high clubical offenses. Masonic processions, with their ornate rituals and ceremonies, clearly parodied official parades of state, like those celebrating the birth of a, or ascension of a prince. But the example I want to give you, and I want to close with one example of such club play, comes uh, from the ancient and honorable Tuesday Club of Annapolis, which included most of the leading literary and political figures in Maryland and the Upper Chesapeake. Um, and it was the June 11th, 1754 oration commemorating the ninth anniversary of the founding of that ancient and honorable club. Now, I focus on this, in many ways it's typical, but they left an incredibly rich documentary uh, source, um, a, a complete set of records and a three-volume manuscript history. And as you read through this quite bizarre uh, document, set of documents, you realize that one of the most recurring amusements in club life was parodic club politics. Members would assume distinct personae, complete with club names, and they would play out the recurring theme of the never-ending contest between courtly power and corruption on the one hand and popular Republican liberty on the other. The first was represented by the club president, who gradually made his power absolute and perpetual by sapping the virtue of his members with luxury. Against him was the club secretary, loquacious Scribble, who represented the country values of real Whig Republican liberty. Now, Scribble begins his oration by decrying the intrusion of luxury into the club, an issue that had been, in fact, central in the debates in, in uh, Maryland newspapers for the previous decade. In the early days, the heroic times of the club, the members had lolled about, about on their chairs in ease, smoking, jesting, punning, drinking, without formality. And in that epic of Spartan virtue, club liberty flourished. Alas, that liberty had been lost by the introduction of luxury, specifically the luxuries of the table by that nefarious club president, Nassifer Joel. So Squibble begins by the introduction of Iraq. Iraq is a very fine uh, and expensive Mediterranean liquor, uh, anise flavored. Rack, that expensive liquor has been introduced. Rack, so bewitching to our refined palates because far-fetched large tables have been set out covered with clean, fine linen, nicely pinched and sweetly perfumed with lavender and roses. Elegant dishes of meat and exquisite desserts have been curiously ranged thereon. The rooms and passage splendidly illuminated with sconce lights in the forms of rhombuses, squares, triangles, and circles. Vocal music has been warbled forth most mellifluously. An iced cake made its appearance, which was dealt about in luncheons to the members, curiously enveloped in clean white paper. This cake, this fatal cake, may we not conjecture, completed the catastrophe of the liberty of this here ancient and honorable club? And as Esau sold his birthright to Jacob for fair words and a mess of porridge, so this unhappy club has bartered their liberty to a certain great man for an old song, rack punch, plum pudding, four pu pounds of candles, and an iced cake. <laughs> well, Scribble is clearly caricaturing the long-standing country concern of the debilitating effects of luxury on liberty. But the play gets even deeper when the reader recalls that in earlier chapters, the real source of the president's absolute power wasn't simply his luxurious table, but the introduction of royal and aristocratic its insignia into the club, a club seal, and then later the dreaded canopy of state, which is basically an umbrella. <laughs> and the source of these heraldic tokens of submission and tyranny, none other than Secretary Scribble himself. The author of the history warns us about the duplicitous nature of Scribble, who he describes as regularly, quote, promoting and establishing bribery and corruption. Well, the joke is only fully appreciated when the re reader realizes that this two-faced corrupter and betrayer of the liberty of the club, loquacious Scribble, is in fact the author, Dr. Alexander Hamilton, a prominent physician <laughs> legislator and member of the court party in Maryland. So is Hamilton's performance meant to demonstrate the vacuity or dishonesty of country politics and its 
real Whig ideology? Or are we to see in Scribble's perfidy a cautionary tale about those very dangers? How only eternal vigilance can protect liberty from the demagoguery of its purported champions? Well, I would argue the real lesson, as was so often the case in the Enlightenment, is one of worldly moderation and disenchantment. Both sides posture for purely partisan advantages. Neither represents the true public interest. Luxury can be innocent, but it can also be corrupting. Just as the clarion call for liberty can come just as easily from demagogues as patriots. In one sense, then, Hamilton embraces both positions. This is perhaps best reflected in Club Maxim 37. Quote, that it is not convenient or agreeable to the constitution of this year club to be of the same sentiment or opinion for two minutes together. <laughs> the play of politics in clubs like the Tuesday Club thus was kind of like a funhouse mirror. You see the foibles of individuals and parties revealed in outrageous distortion and magnification. But at the same time, it was also a temporary release from the reality of such political forces, because the people engaging in this play are the leading politicians of both parties in Maryland. It gave them a chance um, to gain the, the moderating perspective of laughter and ridicule, a space where politics could be enacted as a game without consequence and rancor. So then I want to conclude on this thought that the club then was both a space for play and a locus for the diffusion of new learning. And that's, in fact, that combination was what made it the master institution of the American Enlightenment. Within its confines, the great debates of the age were engaged by men who were inculcated with values of moderation, complacence, and tolerance. But its most telling accomplishment was fusing pleasure with the Republican form of organization. Because what that did is it created a hybrid of associations that gave evidence to a new, distinctly modern mode of Republican self-government. It situated the old classical ideal of liberty as Spartan heroism within a horizon of refined pleasure. One that saw public liberty as the means to promote the development of the self every bit as much as an object of self-sacrifice for community. In a word, the club taught its denizens that a modern republic could both secure the life and liberty of its citizens as well as allow them to pursue their happiness. Thank you very much.